morning, everyone. How are you doing? Are you feeling excited? I'm feeling excited this morning. That's one of those verses or readings that I'm sure you're familiar with, but there's so much packed in there that we're going to try and look at a little bit uh, this morning. As part of this uh, series that we're in, this vision series, We Are SPS, who's enjoying that little uh, trailer? Seen a photo of yourself? Any good photos out there? <laughs> Me and Andrew we've decided that you can't get a worse photo than either one of us. No. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's good fun though, isn't it? And what we're doing is we are celebrating and articulating who we are as a church. And uh, the vision of St. Paul Shadwell is that we're a church that's passionate about making disciples, transforming communities, and planting churches. And I hope you've heard that before, and if you haven't, you will hear it again and again and again, so that you can remember it and own it and be excited about it. And uh, last week, Rick looked in particular at uh, the, the emphasis of this year uh, as a year of discipleship, Invest 2013, where you can uh, invest in yourself as a, as a disciple, where you can grow, but also uh, we really want to encourage you to invest in each other so that we are a, a church where disciples are making disciples. And so we looked at this whole idea that we are disciples. This week, we're looking at connect groups. And when you get me talking about connect groups, I can go on for some time, so we'll see. But before I go on for some time, I thought it would be quite fun uh, to hear about what you think about connect groups. So it, who's in a connect group? Would you just like to stand where you are? That would be amazing. Thank you very much. Philippa, why are you in a connect group? Because it's nice to have a close family around me. Is this working? Oh, it is no, now. Working for Just you. try that again. It's nice to have a close family around. Close family, brilliant. Thank you very much. Beth? Uh, it's regular fellowship together. Okay. Andrew. Oh, um, <laughs> it's great fun. We have lots of fun in our connect group. Fun's good. I think I'll come over there. Torres, thank goodness he's passing me by. That's good. Uh, a man. Here we go. Um, it's. Uh, it's just a place to share, um, share life, whatever you're going through. Pretty good, thank you. Um, yeah, I agree with that. I think it's a good place where you can open up your heart and get encouragement. It's a good place where you can sort of help each other to grow and develop in the faith. Brilliant. And last but not least, all the way over here. <laughs> Neko got baptised a little while ago. Why, why are you part of a connect group? Um, I think it's just an amazing fellowship. It's a great way to get deeper into the scriptures and really help uh, have people hold you accountable for things that you're trying to work on. Brilliant. Give them all a round of applause. That's a good job. All right, that's my sermon done. See you later. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, do you notice the emphasis? Fellowship, friendship, it's fun to be together. And actually that should come as no surprise to us because loneliness, isolation, is one of the key issues facing Londoners today. Londoners are lonely. I experienced this myself a couple of weeks ago. I had the flu and I was out for the entire week and uh, I was too ill to watch television. I was too ill to go on the laptop. I was too ill to listen to music or to read. So I stayed in bed staring up at the lights in my ceiling. I have an incredible kind of sense of their detail now that I didn't have before. And uh, I think it might even have been day one. It was certainly no later than day two. In desperation of my boredom and isolation, I was just going insane. Joanne phones me up from work and says, how are you doing? I said, babe, you need to come home. And so she tells her colleagues that her husband is on death's door. Uh, so she really needs to go home to care for him. And, uh, and that was an almighty relief for me because just being isolated in that way was intense. And I experienced it again uh, last weekend when uh, Joanne and Amelia uh, went off to see her mum. And, uh, you know, sometimes you think, guys, fantastic, I've got a bit of space, a bit of freedom. What am I going to do with myself? So I watched a few movies and, you know, that was, that was good. But in those moments where you're just sat at home by yourself, you go, hmm. I miss my family. I felt lonely. It was hard work. And loneliness in London is a key issue. In November 2012, the BBC uh, did a poll of Londoners and found that 27% of Londoners were lonely, some or all of the time. 
28% of Londoners felt there was a little sense of community or no sense of community. 33% of Londoners didn't know their neighbours at all, and of course that rises to 38% when you live where we do, in inner London. And it's a significant issue, not just for those who are uh, a little bit older, for those over 65, but also for young adults between the ages of 18 and 30. And it's a serious matter, because the consequences of loneliness are profound. Sane, the mental health charity, uh, a spokesman for that, uh, commenting on this poll, said this, it's not a big step to go from feeling persistently lonely to having clinical depression. It's a serious matter. The Downing Street Nudge Unit, which is their uh, kind of creative, cutting-edge way of trying to get us to behave in particular ways by nudging us, says that loneliness is more dangerous to our health than smoking or obesity. The University of North Carolina did a study where they pulled together another 149 studies, so they were looking at the responses from 309,000 people, so a huge study, and they found that there was a 50% higher survival rate with those who had stronger social relationships. That's incredible, isn't it? It, made, it meant that Mark Easton, the BBC journalist, said this, company, friendship, is much more important in reducing the risk of dying than losing weight, taking exercise, or giving up booze or fags. Now, as Christians, are we surprised by that? No, we're not, are we? Because we know that human beings are made for relationship because we are made in the image of God. And God is relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so, of course, we are social beings. So, friendship has a profound impact on our physical lives, but it also has a profound impact on our spiritual lives. Christianity is a social faith. We are in it together. You can't be a Christian apart from the church. And I've mentioned it before, but as we were looking at, you know, how does discipleship take place? How are our hearts changed? How is our character formed? We recognize that the most significant impact on our lives were those around us. We changed if we're in community with one another. And so that's why the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 10 says this, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So friendship is hugely significant for us as Christians, for us as disciples. So what's our response to that, to those findings as St. Paul Shadwell? Well, it's a simple one. Connect groups. That's it. To experience St. Paul Shadwell, SPS, in its fullest sense, you need to be in a connect group. What is a connect group? It's a good question. Why Do they work this way? Why do we work this way? What does it mean in practice, on the ground? What does it look like? Well, those are the the questions that we're going to explore a little bit this morning. But it begins with this idea that we are friends. That we are friends. You see, as far as connect groups are concerned, size matters. A connect group is a mid-sized group. That means it is a group made up of about 15 to 35 people. And you might say, why does that matter? Well, there are two good reasons for that. The first is it works. Notice in your passage, if you've got your Bible in front of you, do keep it open. That would be amazing. We will be referring to it. Look at verse 46. They met together in their homes. Now, that word homes in Greek is the word oikos. It's a little bit of a technical term. It it means household. Um, But It's not the sort of nuclear family picture that we have today. It's much broader than that. It included the householder and his family. It included their slaves, their dependents, their business associates. Uh, In Romans 16, uh, where Paul talks to the churches in Rome, he identifies five different households who were the church in Rome. So Priscilla and Aquila, Narcissus, for example, and others. And when you dig into it, you realize that this idea of household is actually a key term in the New Testament. So uh, Peter mentions it in his first letter. Paul mentions it as he writes to the Ephesians. He mentions it again as he writes to Timothy. 
And it was the main expression of the church for the first 350 years of its existence. And it's an extraordinary phenomenon. You think, right at the beginning of the life of the church, we've just read it here, there were a thousand believers. 350 years later, there were 33,880,000 believers. In 350 years. That's an increase from 0.0017% to 56.5% of the Roman Empire. That is extraordinary growth, isn't it? And all of that at a time where Christianity was illegal, where it was facing persecution, where there were no public buildings where Christians worshipped, but there was a lot of food. As believers gathered together as households, So it works. Secondly, it's needed. Sociologists talk about uh, the way human beings occupy different spaces in our lives. So uh, we occupy public space, for example. This is a public space. And we will meet uh, maybe colleagues or acquaintances, and we will engage in small talk, which is lovely as far as it goes. But we also uh, meet together in what sociologists call social space, And that might be groups of friends at a party. And there we tend to talk a little bit more depth about our lives. Then there is personal space. And again, that's a smaller group of people, maybe your family, close friends perhaps. And in that context, you feel free enough and open enough and confident enough to talk about yourself. And then lastly, sociologists talk about intimate space. And they say here, only one or two like lovers, really, whispering sweet nothings to each other. And interestingly, in London, one of those layers is missing. Social space. So we find that we will be in a public space on a regular basis, at work or wherever else we may be. Uh, We spend time with our families a lot and our loved ones, but then we've run out of time. And so this social space, this household, this where we can develop friendship is missing. And perhaps that's why you're here. You've been looking for that place to belong. That's what Londoners Londoners are looking for, where they can live life with others, where they can have that sense of coming home, where they can build friendships that last a lifetime. And that... Social space, if you've been in, in one, it has a momentum, a buzz, an energy about it, doesn't it? You can meet people like you. It's not a group of oddballs that you kind of walk in and think, oh no, I don't get on with anybody here. You will meet people more like yourself. It's a place where actually it's small enough for you to be missed. A group of 30 people, hang on a second. We haven't seen Bob for a little while. How's he doing? But it's big enough so that it's easy to join, so you don't have that experience where you walk into somebody's front room and there are five other people there looking at you saying, why are you walking into my group? Are you going to ruin my relationships? So a connect group is a social space. It's a household. It works. It's needed. But what happens when you get there? What should you expect? Well, over the last few months, we've been working out what goes on in a connect group, thinking through things together, talking to people, trialing ideas, and we've begun to develop this this rhythm that I just wanted to share with you. And the rhythm is like this. We are, in essence, friends. That is what a connect group is. But as part of that, there are three elements to a connect group. We are worshippers, we are disciple makers, and we are missionaries. And we're just going to start with that first one. We are worshippers. Look at the passage. They devoted themselves to, verse 42, the prayers. That's corporate worship. Verse 43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs. Verse 47, they were together praising God. And you see in verse 46 there that they did that in the temple, which is like this this morning. But they also did it in their homes, this household, this mid-sized group, our connect groups. 
And so if you imagine a monthly pattern of four weeks, week one of a connect group, it all gathers together. However many are in that connect group, we all gather together, we share a meal, and we worship. And then we hear from God's word, and we pray for each other. It's as simple as that. And so in this first week of the month, the connect group is a place to encounter God. I remember being in a a group in our front room in Wimbledon and we worshipped together and the presence of God was extraordinary. All we had was one guy on a guitar. It's memorable even to me now, that was 10 years ago. When we meet together as a staff team, there are about 30 of us with the other churches around, it's one of the uh, highlights of the week as we come together as a mid-sized group to worship God. The intensity of it is powerful. On Thursday, uh, we worshipped as a small group of uh, uh, disciples as part of our year of discipleship, our intern scheme called Urban Impact. And, uh, and again, the, the spirit fell upon us and nobody wanted to leave. So Bob ran out of songs and we stood there. And you could see God moving on people. And we just stood there because nobody wanted to let go of what we are experiencing in that mid-sized group. So it's a place to encounter God. It's also a place for your gifts. It's a great place for you to grow in the gifts you feel God has given you. It's a place where you can play your part, where you can fan into flame, as Paul says to Timothy. Your worship gifts, your teaching gifts. If you are into prayer ministry, So if you want an encounter with God or you want to uh, minister, I have one thing to say to you. Join a connect group. We are worshippers. Secondly, we are disciple makers. Look at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And then verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. And so imagine that month, we've moved on from week one, we're on week two, and again in week four, so a fortnightly pattern, the connect group breaks up into small groups. And a small group is a group of between four and eight people, including the small group leader. And so it's a, a place which is small enough to be safe. It's not social space, it's personal space. It's where you can share your life with a few, where you can be honest and authentic and vulnerable. It's the place where pastoral care can take place. It's where you can develop a sense of ownership, a real sense of commitment to one another. It is the place where we hope to incubate disciple makers, that these small groups become catalysts for spiritual growth. So these small groups, week two and four of the month, are the place to make disciples. They are intentional. The leader disciples the group as the group disciples one another. Connect group leaders disciple small group leaders. And so what do you see throughout the church? Disciples making disciples as that cascades through the church. So it's a place to make disciples. It's also a place to put the Bible into practice. These small groups will be centered on the Bible. We'd love to encourage that. Not the sort of Bible study where you're simply learning information or pooling your ignorance together. I've been in many of those, my ignorance included. This, uh, we're encouraging you to explore a, a form of Bible study called a discovery Bible study. Because when you discover something, when we discover something for ourselves, that's when we really learn, isn't it? Not when somebody tells us something or teaches something to us, but when we discover it for ourselves. And the radical edge of these discovery Bible studies is that they're obedience-based. So you put what you've just read into practice. And so they're based around three very simple questions. What does it say? Allow the Bible to speak to you. What does it mean? Discover its meaning for yourself. And thirdly, What will you do about it? So these small groups are a place of accountability where together we can say, how is it going? How did you respond? What are you doing about what God said to you that week? And of course, these intimate relationships, they are the ones that make change possible. I remember a time in Oxford where we were in a small group together 
four or five of us, and uh, we were wrestling with our characters, and as we all do, and one guy was just trying to keep us at arm's length. And very lovingly, very gently, together we just challenged that, and he was able to grow and to move on. So we are disciple makers. If you want to be a disciple maker, again, I have one simple thing to say to you. Join a connect group. If you want to change, if you want to be a disciple, not just an attendee, if you are passionate about the Bible, join a connect group. We are disciple makers. And thirdly, we are missionaries. Look at verse 45. They gave to anyone who had need. And then verse 47. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Mission is an essential part of connect group life. Not in a sporadic or occasional sense. Because the church is itself mission. It doesn't have a mission. It is mission. And so, if you think about our monthly rhythm. We've seen week one, week two, week four, week three. We gather back together, everyone in the connect group, all together on mission. And so we'd love to see you guys uh, inviting friends and colleagues and neighbours and family to something that is it's just low bar. It's an easy invite. It might be anything almost, a supper party, a meal, it might be a games night. I said that for the OPs. Um, It might be a visit or a trip or a walk. It might be street pastors or night shelter. It might be a food bank collection. Any time of the week that works. But that week, once a month, we're doing mission together. It's part of our rhythm, our life together. And so a connect group is a place to witness. It's designed to be easy to invite someone to. It's not intruding. It's allowing you to invite your friends to meet people like you and like them. Of course, it's also a place to serve because it's big enough to make a difference. It has momentum. It's big enough to maximize the contacts and the skills of its members so it avoids burning out the few. And you know, it is amazing what you can do together. We ran uh, our most Uh, our biggest alpha course for a few years last term through the Kingdom Connect group. They just stopped what they were doing and said, right, we're going to be there every Wednesday and make it happen. We couldn't have done it without them. It was fantastic. A few years ago, I was, uh, it was a great day, Uh, one of the uh, Connect groups at another church um, got together to build a community garden for the estate. And you saw uh, members of the church, this particular connect group called uh, Dwell and uh, uh, Bengalis all around together building a garden and it's still going. It was fantastic. So if you want to see people saved, if you want to impact your community, I've got one thing to say to you this morning. Join a connect group. We are missionaries. So what are we saying? We are saying we are friends. We are in it together. That is the essential definition of a connect group. That's why we do what we do. But within that, we are worshippers. Within that, we are disciple makers. Within that, we are missionaries. But you notice one thing. How seriously did this early church take those things? How seriously do we take those things? How much do they matter in our lives? Well, I think we need to say we are devoted. Look at verse 42. The early church was devoted to all of these things. And that word there, it means passionate and fervent. It really matters. But it also means determined. There is a persistent, constant focus 
Sometimes it's not easy to be in community together. Sometimes we don't get on with everybody. And yet there is this sense of ownership that says, this matters more than anything else. And so for us, the Connect Group is the vehicle. If you want to say, we are SPS, the Connect Group is the vehicle. It's not the only vehicle out there in church life. It's not the only expression of church life. You'll find many different ones with many different names, but this is our vehicle. This is our expression. So I would love to encourage you to join in. We are aiming not for 50% of people belonging to connect groups, not for 60%, not for 70%, not for 80%, not for 90%. We are aiming for 100%. So if you're not in a connect group, we're after you. (laughs) No, I don't mean that like that. But they were devoted to these things. And you know, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to join a connect group. And so, this morning, we are going to launch a new connect group. Cheers. (laughs) And uh, Joanne and I, Joanne, would you like to come up here? Thank you very much. Are going to lead it with Jessica. There she is. Oh, you are over there, marvellous. I was like, she hasn't come in. It's five past. Come over as well. Round of applause. Thank you. Come on up. And this Connect Group, I hope, will reflect some of the values of the things we've been talking about uh, this morning. It's going to be a place where together we passionately pursue the presence of God. It's going to be a place where together we have this radical commitment to being present to one another where relationships will matter. And it's going to be a place where we have this practical determination to be a presence to those around us. And we would love you to pray for us, because it is a new venture, isn't it? (laughs) And we would love you to join us if you are not in a connect group already. So if you live around Shadwell or within that kind of area, Come and grab us at the back afterwards and say, Rod, I'm devoted to this. Jessica, Joanne, I'm devoted to this. I want to join in. I want to be part of what you are doing. Let me pray for us. You guys stay there. Father, we... We are made for relationship, we know that. It's not good for us to be alone. The amazing thing is you have given us a community to belong to. Somewhere where we can come home, where we can be ourselves, where we can make friends. Father, whatever obstacles there may be to being part of that, overcome them, Lord, we pray, so that together... We can be worshippers experiencing your presence. We can be disciple makers growing in our own faith and helping others grow in theirs. And we can be missionaries reaching out to those around us with the good news of your son serving this world that you love so much. And Father, we pray for this new connect group. We thank you for all our connect groups. We thank you for the life that um, hums away within each of them. We pray for all of those who lead them. Pour out your spirit upon them. And Father, as you do this new thing, help us to follow in your wake, to hear your voice and pursue you together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So do come and grab us after the service. We will be by the door. Thank you, guys.